Everybody my name is Liz Driscoll, and I'm the president of the Alums, and I want to introduce some of our other board members here. Christina Langlois is head of uh, the History Panel, too, and organized all of us, too. Woo! Yay! Woo! Yay! Yay! It's Brittany Peterson, who is our um, communications chair, so anything that you would have gotten from the Alums, she is in charge of that. So. Yay! Good job, Brittany! Yeah. 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 Uh, we have uh, Mark Peterson, who is uh, class of 77 and fantastic coordinator. Lauren McGinnity, class of, I forget, 10. Oh my goodness. That's a very good Oh, and Andrew Levin, who is uh, filming us today, too. So. Hi, y'all. He's our president of life, too. So we're super polite. And of course, uh, we have Kasusha Prabhan. Did I spell it? Did I say it correctly? There you go. Anyway, so she's the class of 12 who says to me at a tailgate of who's that old guy? No, I didn't. You say did, it. and he was the class of 11. And no. No. Oh, okay. Oh, hey. oh, gosh, so, so we're going to have she's telling to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But she's going to be our new because you're going to. She's going to be our new events person too, so it gets no confusion there. And to of course Pete Freeman, who was instrumental in organizing our whole No Ones organization, she's always been happy. Yes, sir. And then of course Mr. Mrs. Painter and Bruce too. So thank you. Yay. 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 Before we get started on this, we want to do a special unveiling. So, um, I don't know if we have anybody from the late 90s here, too, but the second Rose Bowl. So, I don't think there's too many first Rose Bowlers here. Uh, the second. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for the second Rose Bowl, um, we've been wanting to do something. We, you know, the band is starting their third year of these new uniforms, so we want to do something special with the uniforms that they had. So, we've been trying to find something that would be appropriate for that, too. So, we are ready to unveil of the so we're still working on uh, you know how all of this will be presented too so in the next couple of weeks we'll send an email out on how you can order one of these too but uh so for that and they did a super job like they had uniform numbers and stuff too so hopefully uh you know and, and, uh, that people would like this so of course we'll offer to them once first but i'm sure like university in general would really appreciate this too so anyway on with the show thank you okay um thank you all for coming Thank you. Smaller. You know, we're going to put it on the internet. Intimate. Intimate. Yes. I like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the topic for today is, again, Nummelum's history, but I always, I wanted to call it the ch ch, -ch changes panel, um, <laughs> because it's from the 60s and 70s, and a lot of stuff changed in the band during that period. We started this little thing called the Spirit Leader, um, which is kind of an institution now, and we also, like, added women to the band. Um, thank you, Title IX. Yeah. So, <laughs> it was interesting. Before that, there were women twirlers, so don't get me wrong, there were women. Well, actually, well, man, there was one. Uh, so, it was an interesting change, and this is a period where a lot of that change took place, which is why I thought it was a great topic. Uh, so, our panelists today are Mr. Chuck Laws, um, Charles Neverable. Never Neverable. Never I am so horrible it's at easy. It's easy. Never sick. Never ah. ill. Never. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. That's good. Uh, Debbie Katz Knowles, uh, Connie Donnelly, Gary Rubin, and of course Pete Friedman. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and have everybody just introduce themselves, including when you graduated, what you studied. <laughs> oh, this is easy. <laughs> graduated, studied, and what parts of band were you in? And of course, when did you play? So, if you want to go ahead and start. Could you go over that again, please? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So okay. When did you graduate? And what did you study? And then what band organizations were you with? I'm Chuck Hawes. I was here from 63 to 67. 1963. <laughs> uh, I was a music major. I was a started out as a saxophone player and played clarinet for a little while in the band. I ended up actually playing tuba, which is a story that's too long to tell today, but actually I started carrying the tuba. <laughs> yeah, the second season I was actually playing the alma mater. And that's harder than playing it. <laughs> Just moving the horn around the field was the big issue. Um, what else was I supposed to tell them? Oh, um, 
So as a music major, I was, in addition to being in a marching band, I was in the symphonic band, the wind ensemble, and played WAMU for four years, and all the usual things that music majors did. The marching band back in those days was almost all music majors. There were a few people from the university at large, but, uh, it, and of course it was all male, as we're going to discuss later. Um, it didn't smell very good either, as I recall. <laughs> But that was probably due to the fact that those uniforms we had then were very heavy, heavy wool. And for the first month or so, we were sweating up a storm in them. And uh, they got sent out for cleaning every year at the end of the season, but it didn't help all that much. Mm. Charlie. Does this work? Funny you should mention the uniforms. I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a moment. I was here from 1958 and graduated in 1963. Those were the Hausian days when uh, Era Persegan was coach, and John Painter was the bandmaster of the best band, damn band in all the land. And if John Painter hadn't have been the bandmaster, then I'm sure he would have been the coach because he was so interested in football. <laughs> and I'll never forget those days. Um, I was a tech student, and there were quite a few tech students, at least in the matriculation class, mine in 1958. Uh, a lot of guys I knew came in from high school and other people, and uh, I was one of those that stayed around for five years in the marching band. Um, I'm not sure why I played in other uh, organizations, but I did play in the symphonic band uh, when I was a freshman, I believe. Maybe a, a sophomore as well. By that time, John had probably switched me over to a color instrument like the bass clarinet, and eventually I was playing the contrabass, B-flat contrabass uh, the clarinet. Uh, because um, nobody else would do it, I guess. <laughs> and I, I, I loved it, and I used to get a call uh, every winter quarter uh, after the season was over, and Mr. Painter would say, Charlie, come on and play in the, in the symphonic wind ensemble. John, I'm too busy. I, I, I can't do that. You know, I'm in tech. He said, you know, a busy person can always find time in the schedule to do something that they really want to do, and, and I would say yes. Uh, <laughs> almost immediately, it didn't take much to convince me, and I'm and I'm certainly glad I did. Um, I'll never forget those years. Was I supposed to say something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, uniforms. No, uniforms. no, no. We're gonna get to that. Okay, okay. I promise. All right. I'm Debbie Katz Knowles. I was a music major. Um, my main instrument is percussion and drums. And in those days, the percussion section was like 10 people. It was like four snare drums, I think, um, two bass drums, a triple, a couple cymbals. It wasn't like 20 or 30 people like it is now. So there was, there was a waiting list. So I wasn't in it at all at the very beginning of the year. And then a couple weeks later, a call went out. They had some holes to fill. So I wound up in a rank of alto saxes, which nobody knew this yet, but I had an alto sax, I knew how to play it. So I played a cowbell for about a week, which was really boring, but at least I was there learning stuff. So Jim Suddeth was the conductor, and I said, you know, I have an alto sax, I'd like to play it. Um, you know, can I play for you? And he looked at me like, okay. And I mean, they're not, they weren't that hard. I could count, I could play. So I played a couple songs for me, he says, oh, great, that's great. So that's how I wound up being saxophone. Two years later, my junior year, they needed more tenors, so I moved to tenor. So I played alto my first two years, and then um, tenor my last two years. Um, in, in, in our day also, it was mostly music majors, maybe like two-thirds music majors. And so all of our cohorts that were in all our classes with us were, were in the band. And I have something to say later about the uniforms, too. Yes. <laughs> That's why it's a cool call. Okay, maybe. Okay. Um, I'm Connie Donnelly, and uh, I was one of the few first women at the first rehearsal. Um, I knew uh, Bruce and his sister Megan from high school, and I knew it had been all men the year before, so when I got that card that said, do you want to belong to any of these activities? And I checked it, and I wrote a note saying, yeah, but I'm a girl. And I don't remember if you called me or, yeah, you must have called me, Bruce. And he's like, well, guess what? Letting, letting girls be a part of the group. So, you know, I was kind of 
So I joined, and uh, there were four of us at the first rehearsal, and ten by the end of the first year. And uh, I eventually married one of the members of the marching band. Not somebody I really knew, except for the guy going, hey, did you know so-and-so? And that person was in my high school math class, so um, that was my introduction to my future husband. Um, I was a music major as well. I played French horn, and um, part of what made me curious about joining the band was that my high school band, marching band experience was so lame that uh, I thought, well, let's see what this is like. And I was so amazed by how organized it was and all the numbers, and you knew exactly where you were going for each count. And since I was a music major for music education, I thought, well, maybe someday I'll have a high school marching band myself. Well, that hasn't happened, but that's okay. Um, so it turned out to be something that, although it really didn't do my chops that much help at the beginning of the year when you were going to do your auditions the week after marching band camp, um, I still wanted to do it because it just was such a great experience and it made you feel like you were part of something really big. So, awesome. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Gary Irvin, um, 1969 to 1973, the College of Arts and Sciences, I guess before a Weinberg had up and down. Yes, that's what it's called now. Yep. Um, I was a commuter, and I lived at home in Chicago, about 20 minutes from campus. And uh, being a commuter, there wasn't a real connection to uh, the campus as somebody who lived on campus, like my daughter did, who graduated in 2006. And uh, the band provided like a home for me. And it was the, uh, kind of the best thing I did, which had absolutely no credit attached to it whatsoever. <laughs> uh, I remember auditioning for Mr. Painter. Uh, I think it was before the band, they had to play something for them, and then slightly to go um, I also played in the summer band, which would play uh, very narrow on Wednesday evenings at concerts. And uh, we rehearsed, I think, uh, a couple of days a week. And that was a lot of fun, because I like sight reading a lot of music, and every week it was different music to do. And I did play somewhat in the concert band here during the first couple of years. Um, and I have more to say, uh, I can just mention briefly, was of course Old Mail. I guess it became uh, co-ed my last year. I thought it was my second year, but reading the notes, it's, it was my, my last year. <laughs> we had a twirler, Sophie Ann Schwab, and I have the uh, distinct honor of uh, introducing her to her husband. Oh, mm -hmm. he, he was in the carpool with me in the north side of town. <laughs> he wanted me very, very badly. And I, I just you know, made the introduction, not that he couldn't have been on his own. And uh, I haven't been in touch with any of them, but uh, hopefully they still uh, I still get in touch with them. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Good. Okay, I have more to say, but now introductions. <clears throat> Pete Friedman, class of 1979, radio TV film major. Uh, I was in the marching band 1975 to 1978 and spirit leader my senior year. Uh, I arrived at Northwestern a clarinetist, oboist, and bass clarinetist, but there were so many outstanding musicians here. I was clearly one of the least competent musicians in the marching band and knew that that was as far as I would go ensemble-wise. So that was my only musical outlet that I got the most of it that I possibly could and uh, uh, it changed my life. I realized I forgot to say what groups I played in. So I was in the main ensemble in the symphonic band, and I played in WAMU for three years, and I was in the orchestra, and I played in the uh, basketball band for two years. Yeah. I forgot that too. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Everything except for the basketball band. I was in all the shows. I was in every band, every orchestra. Because in those, in those days, I think my freshman or sophomore year, we had 10 percussion majors. And that, so we were in everything. We were in everything, which was nice. Well, you, some of you touched on it already, and I wanted to have you talk about who your band director was, wh uh, what your initial impressions were, and uh, what you thought of the overall leadership of the band during your time with the band. Anybody, this is, anybody can jump in. Uh, I, I feel very strongly on this one because it was uh, such a seminal moment for me. Uh, my first day of band camp, we were in Old Music Hall, um, before Regenstein was built, and we practiced in 011. And uh, John Painter was one of the most gifted speakers I ever knew, and one of the most inspirational people. And I sat there with my jaw hanging and thought, if this is what college is going to be like, I am going to love it here. 
when I went to uh, the band here, there was no band camp. So, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there was no band camp. Well, you're right. And there were a lot of changes during our periods. I think we should talk about those changes. We used to rehearse on a gravel uh, parking lot, and the knees would be uh, raw after rehearsal and wheeling on gravel. Um, things were, 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 were different, uh, although the main things have always been the same. Can you know, others of you comment on, on what changes took place? Well, I was going to say, when I, was, I forgot to even say when I was in school. I was in school from <laughs> fall of 72, so Title IX went through, and yeah. 72 in the fall, and I graduated in 76. Um, when I got there, I had two years, I believe, with Jim Suddeth, and he was um, from the <coughs> south, uh, well, he's from Texas, Texas, but that was their tradition was lots of marching drills and stuff like that, so um, that was pretty impressive. I mean, I, I had said how I was impressed with the way drills were laid out and the fact that all of the parts were written by hand and then they had to get them copied, and sometimes they were up until all hours of the night just trying to finish a drill because we changed drills every week. Um, and then there was, and now correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, I'm not sure, but uh, your dad came and was at my junior year. Was that when Megan started, that he was then the band director for one year? With Jim? Um, uh, after Jim left. Well, he kind of, you know, he was like the utility infielder there for a while. Right. So, I mean, he was always in there, right. but um, he sort of uh, resumed the, the helm for a short time. And then the third year was... Cliff uh, Cole. Was, the fourth year was Cliff Cole. Did Cliff do two years? Yeah. Okay. I think well, he did more. He did more. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but it might just have been one or two of my, my years. And so he was quite different and uh, had did not necessarily have a big marching band background, uh, but a whole different kind of approach to things. But either way, it was always impressive and you always felt like you had wonderful uh, leadership and guidance. Well, Cliff Colnup did some of the really, couple of the really best arrangements. That was one of the things that, that Christina asked me, the, the great arrangements and of course, JP did Hello Dolly and Saints and um, Bill Bailey. But Cliff did I Write the Songs, Cliff did Hey Jude. Those are the first two. But there was a couple more, but he Cliff did yeah, no, the no, more, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. more the yeah. more the pop and rock ones and they were they were fabulous arrangements. He was a difficult guy to get along with. We'll leave it at that. But very talented, great at arranging. I did a lot of copying and stuff for him, so and then I was a grad so I worked a lot with him. Very talented, did a lot of did a lot of good things. Yeah. Anything from the early years about the leadership of the band? Well, I already mentioned uh, something about uh, my impressions of John Vinner, and I certainly um, echo the comments that Pete made just a few moments ago. I don't know if we had band camp or not, but I remember coming and playing and rehearsing with the band well before school started. I guess a, a lot of what goes on now is before school starts. I mean, all four of the football games were before school started this, this year. Uh, but I, I remember uh, some of those early rehearsals too. Um, there was a little guy running around the tower who people refer to as Bruce over there. Uh, oh. <laughs> must have been, been about seven years old or something like that. His father was on the tower and his kids were running around there. And uh, that, I don't know if it impressed me, but I don't remember it a lot. And, and, and then got to know Bruce a, a lot a lot better. And, and throughout the years, uh, yeah, the leadership, John Painter's leadership was very influential in my life. Uh, taught me um, the values that have carried me through good times and bad. Well, John, of course, was the conductor and director of the marching band in the years that I was here. I also had the good fortune to have known Mr. Bainham for about 10 or 12 years before he passed away. I worked for him, helping him with some of the transcriptions that he did. I played for him when he would guest conduct some of the groups I was in. Um, as a member of the North Shore Concert Band for about 40 years, uh, I got to work with John Painter for a very long time, um, and with Mr. Bainham, who came as a guest conductor, and of course with Mallory, who then became music director after John passed away. Um, John Painter was uh, probably the most inspiring person I've ever known. 
in my life. And uh, he also came at about the end of the era of the, the tyrannical conductors. <laughs> and he wasn't by nature that way. He was a very kind and very generous and, and uh, very loving person. But he also had the ability to put on that character, uh, which he did, especially with the young band staff members, which I was at that time. Uh, if we can indulge a quick story. Go for it. Uh, does everyone here know Fred Hemke? Oh, here. God, yes. Yeah. Um, well, one Sunday afternoon, uh, the band staff is hanging around music hall waiting for Mr. Painter to show up to start working on the arrangements for the next week's show. And uh, he was delayed because he was conducting something in the afternoon and got there fairly late in the afternoon and had a full 12 minute show to write. Uh, so he's in his office working at the piano and writing the first score, and the band staff is waiting around to start copying the first arrangement. Someone comes up with a stadium horn. If you remember those things, it's a, about three feet long, made of plastic, got like a brass mouthpiece at the end, and it sounds kind of like a an asthmatic moose. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the trombone players said, wow, a stadium horn. He grabs his thing and goes, Bleh! Well, Mr. Painter comes storming out of his office. What the hell are you doing out here? I'm in there trying to work and you're making all this commotion. He said, how are we going to get this show done? Went on for about 10 minutes and we were all about this tall when he got done with us. Goes back in his office, slams the door so hard the wall shook. And we're just sitting there absolutely petrified. About 10 seconds pass. And Fred Hemke, who was then in his mid-twenties, had been on the faculty for about three years, <coughs> comes bounding up the steps in the music hall, and looks at us all sitting there like this, and he says, what's going on here? Oh, a stadium horn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. I don't know the end of the story because the staff just vanished <laughs> <laughs> down the stairs, out both doors. Out the window. Oh, 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 the next question I have um, is uh, how, what were the changes during that time? Uh, I wanted to start, first of all, with the marching style because um, y'all talked to me about ranks and files and Greek to me, um, if you're someone from a more recent generation. And so if you could explain how you did marching, because that just was something that I've never heard of. Okay. Well, I, I guess I'll jump in here. Um, the charts that I talked about, in for anyone who's from the computer age, were all done by hand. And so there were these little X's on it. You'd look at the sheet, and it would it would have to identify who was who on there. So. You were, it was like columns and, and pillars, or whatever rows. else, or rows. rows, thank you. Um, so each, as you go down the field, I don't remember if they were ranks or files, but you, you had a spot that was like a grid. It was like, um, like a, yeah, like a, um, what do you call those things? Yeah. The grid? Yeah. <laughs> they were anyway, rows, they were rows. They were rows, right, right, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, letter and ten. Right, yeah. and well, I don't remember what I was anymore, but, uh, but it would always pinpoint you. So if you were going to have to travel from one spot to the next, from one page to the next, then it would tell you. But in general, they would type out the whole uh, drill that would say, okay, and it said, this person will take four steps forward, do a three-quarter spin, and four steps to the right, and for each one, so that you would come out exactly where you needed to be. It was not the, so much the flowing kind of, uh, I call it drum course style marching, that uh, is currently what most people do. Like this. And we had to lift our knees up all the time, not just during the previous yeah. It was this. I mean, they went around and <laughs> had me this high. So um, anyway, that was Big Ten style at that time. Um, I think one of the key differences is that, and I'll ask Bruce and Mary to correct me if I'm wrong, that so much goes back to uh, Glenn Cliff Bainham, who was a mathematical genius and figured out that it took eight steps to five yards. And everything from that point forward became mathematical formulas. They were not curvilinear, asymmetrical form, ev forms. Everything was symmetrical, and you could move people in ranks and files. And therefore, mathematically, you could say, by a number of counts, and turn this way and that way, and when you do a three-quarter turn, and 
uh, simply uh, 180. Uh, but it, it worked more symmetrically, and in some ways, um, it may have been a more precise method of teaching instead of you've got to form this arc. It, you knew exactly where you were based on the yard line, hash mark, or whatever. So, and then in order for that to be executed, you had to have a perfect chair step because if you did it the right way, you could never be in the wrong space and the alignment could never be off. It, that was part of the mathematical genius of it. And I'd like, like to add something here, and I saved my uh, bacon <laughs> <laughs> in, in, the, in the fifth year. In my fifth year, I believe I only came to rehearsals on Fridays. I was busy with labs and so forth and so on. I couldn't get to Monday, Wednesday rehearsal, music rehearsal maybe on Thursday night or whenever it was. But uh, knowing those charts, and of course having been around them for five years, you, you, one rehearsal on Saturday morning and most of the time, sometimes they were poking me go over here and go over there, but uh, most of the time I was in the right place at the right time because it was logical and mathematical and great for a tech, techie's mind. I have some pictures and I'll, I can pass them around. These were, that was a drill formation. I'm not sure which one, but this was, these were some of the ideas of here's the cat. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah, the backward arch later. And then here's the Liberty Bell with the sousaphones are the crack up the, up the <laughs> middle of the Liberty Bell, the Liberty Bell march. So I'll pass these around, I mean, later if anyone wants to see them, whatever. Yeah, and I'm sure we, we do. Yeah. I think we, yeah, I think we do too, yeah. Uh, and one yeah. thing you all have told me is that certain drills were used again and again. Yes, because they were so good. Uh -huh. hmm. It's something very different because, you know, in this day and age, they aren't used for years. Right. And yes, what they was, are. Yes, they, yes, they, they are. are. They are. Yes. Yes. We played Rhapsody Saints. in Blue at least two of the Saints four years. And March of the Steelman. <laughs> and we all March of the Steelman. <laughs> yeah. and, That's uh, true. We, all, we know exactly where you're supposed those. to halt. So we always notice. It's like, oh, there's the halt. That person took another step. <laughs> 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 I don't know when the state Saints was first written, but I'm... I remember doing it five years when I was here, and then you were doing it years and later. And Hello Dolly. Hello Dolly. And um, Bill, Bill Bailey. Bill Bailey. Bailey. Those were the, they were fantastic arrangements, they were fantastic drills, and you know, I could probably find my spot <laughs> in one of them right now. Yeah, yeah. Christine, can I, something oh, sort of topical, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. as it applies to Ohio State. Uh, oh, when I was a, when Gary and I were freshmen, I when we were when we were freshmen, um, the word came out that the our game with Ohio State, which was a home game, uh, it was homecoming. It was the first time I learned that visiting bands wouldn't come for homecoming. So we were going to have the whole show. It was ABC regional TV, which doesn't sound like much. It was huge. We'd never been on TV, and so the discussion. I was on staff at the time. The discussion was, well, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to do? We could do Bill Bailey. We could do. Yeah, you know, nobody. <coughs> Nobody could talk, nobody would go in and ask my dad, what are you going to do? It was just speculation, and they would kind of talk about it in front of me, wondering if I knew something. And by the time I got there, I, I had learned not to, not to, <laughs> not to compromise anything. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was going to be one of them. Which one is it going to be? And it ended up, we did all of them. Wow. We did, and, and we had had a home game the week before that, and he came out and said, You're gonna do, we're going to do Hello Dolly in the pregame. We're going to do Saints, and we're going to do a twirling drill, and then we're going to do Bill Bailey. And we had a, we had three practices to get it up, and uh, so it was. Those were that's just the most extreme example of the kind of challenges that were laid on us, and uh, uh, I never knew not to challenge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I remember another Ohio State issue. Sorry. Um, where, you know, the, isn't it Ohio State that they, um, Ohio and the tuba yeah, dots? Yeah. 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 So we did this, we, we did this <laughs> once where, and this was planned, where it was, it was supposed to be hello. And the, the Jerry, the, 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 well, and, and the, and the, <laughs> the announcer said, and now, band, you know, the band is going to, in honor of Ohio State and how they do the script Ohio and the famous, we're going to spell out hello, but it was oh hell. Oh. Yeah, and that was literally, and it was moving, oh hell, just to the point where you could recognize, like, 
Band, and then we'd scatter and went to something else. And that was planned. Change the two L's to CK. Or something. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, the challenge was yeah. they were going to do it upside down and backwards to show how right. we could really do it. Yeah. Right. That's how it should oh, be. Right. Right. That's right. <laughs> well, and I mentioned before that I had ended up as a tuba player, having started as a woodwind man. Um, that came about by a horrible misfortune. Well, two misfortunes, actually. We were having Saturday morning drill before the game, and this was one of the, the only time in my four years that we were on television. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was because who we were playing. Probably. They wouldn't have televised Northwestern otherwise. Um, we're having the Saturday morning drill, and as the band is coming off, we're out in that gravel parking lot, as the band is coming off after running the, the halftime show, one of the tuba players fell over one of the chart boxes and broke his leg. Oh, oh no. So they called the paramedics, so they put him in the ambulance and took him off oh, no. to Evanston Hospital. Well, that left a big hole because we only had 12 sousaphone players, and we had a, I think it was 12 by 12 in those days. So Mr. Painter looks down from the tower and says, and I was not marching at that point. I was on the band staff, and I was doing music and charts and so on. So I wasn't regularly in the block. Mr. Painter says, Hawes, get out there and fill that tuba spot. Well, the drill was over. You know, we'd finished the practice. We could go off to lunch, and then it's the game. I thought, what the heck? <laughs> I thought, well, I'm certainly not going to play this monstrosity. So I took a set of charts, and I circled all the positions that this tuba player was supposed to be in in red, and cut the charts up and put them in the flip folder. <laughs> threw the music out and put the charts in the flip folder. Yeah. And figured, okay, I'll just follow the charts. So we get out there for the halftime show, and the cameras are on, the red lights, you know, on there, and they're out there, we're marching around, and I'm terrified. Um, everything's going pretty well. We're doing our drill. And I had a, one of those 270 degree spins. Mm -hmm. You know, you plant your left foot and spin around and then go this way. Uh, and the flip folder slipped out of my hand and flew no. about five yards off in the other direction. Oh, no. Now, if I'd been playing a piccolo or something, I probably might have thought about whether I could sneak over there and grab it. But the sneak with a sousaphone. You're visible. <laughs> uh, I can't. I can't do that. I can't. And the band at that point had stopped in the kneel, you know, ta-da. Uh, what the heck do I do now? So I figured, all right, I'm just going to get myself between two other sousaphone players, and wherever they go, that's where I go. <laughs> and it, it almost worked. <laughs> <laughs> it, the formations were a little lopsided because sometimes there'd be here, 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 and then there were three. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but thank God JP didn't get after me about that. And I ended up, because this guy never came back again, I ended up playing, mm. not playing. Carrying the <laughs> for the rest of that season and all the next as well. Aww. One of the other traditions, uh, one of the other changes during this period was the introduction of the spirit team, which wasn't really the spirit team to start with. Um, who can comment on the origins of it? I know it happened in the '60s, and I'm not sure if who would be willing to pipe up on that. And I'm going to get silent. I, know I don't know if well, it, it was never organized. It was never. There weren't titles, there wasn't a spirit leader, there wasn't a grinder. Uh, it was just a couple of guys from the percussion section that stood up and did goofy things. Of course. <laughs> I don't know if these were the first two to do that, but they may very well have been. Jim Gordon and Terry Applebaum. Terry Applebaum, who is, he would be horrified if he knew that we were telling this story. Because he's very dignified in his career now. Um, that about spirit leaders and grinders. They're going to be dignified things. <laughs> 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 That's encouraging. There are exceptions. There are directors of the school who think it's major universities, things like that. Terry, I think, was the one who started the Wildcat Band, Can You Growl? Huh? Oh, we were doing that well before that. <laughs> I think I think Terry and well Terry and Jim were basically tremendous experts. And, and, and comedians in their own way. And they had grown and up as friends slight, forever. Slightly, slightly off killer. Yes, very <laughs> well, <laughs> slightly. <laughs> but, but I, I think that, that they were the first ones to, I mean, it was a given that you did not draw attention to yourself when you were sitting in the box. No, Nobody could ever go to the bathroom 
during the game. You could not leave the box. And I don't know if it was ever written or said, but you just didn't. You didn't take your shako off until somebody told you to do it. And when you did, everybody took it off together. So the first time anybody put on a hat that looked any different than anything else was when, I think that's when Terry and, and Jim got started. And then it kind of evolved from there. But yes, because I don't remember in my years anything but this regimentation, this, yep. this discipline. And it reminds me of a story I probably shouldn't even tell, but... Those are the stories yeah. we want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, part of my morning ritual was to make absolutely sure that I didn't have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I was that way for a lot of years before. <laughs> and now it would be a heck of a lot more difficult. And with those uniforms, it was an ordeal. And long underwear, maybe, too. So. Right, and then it's cold. Okay, so now we've talked about where the spirit team came from. Because Pete is actually the only, you're the only spirit team member on the, on the panel. How was it by the time it got to you? Because you were toward the end of this period. I think I needed to ask you to be more specific because things just evolve in, in many ways naturally, just as I've seen since I was spirit leader. Things just evolve. Were you voted? Did you I was elected. Elect? Uh, yeah. Now yeah, there are awesome. auditions and it's a, a more formalized structure. But you were, um, once it got to the point that people were elected spirit leader, you were evaluated pretty much by everybody throughout the year. And you, it wasn't that they were all looking at who's good and who's not. It's just you get a sense of who else is in the band and, and who stands out for one reason or another. And then we'd have an election around the time of the Bandorama and it would be announced uh, between performances or right before one and there would be a handing over or presentation of the hat during the Bandorama. Um, spirit of the uh, Grinder, once that became a formal position, I believe, was always handed down, but uh, um, it, it's evolved into a much more real, ritualistic and uh, competitive role. We didn't campaign or audition, it was just kind of determined. Uh, I, I would also say that now there's a natural tendency to try to, to, to assume you've got to do better than the team before you, and the, the not one up, upmanship, but more meeting and exceeding expectations. So I think the pressure is so much greater on spirit teams today than it was on us. Uh, we were expected to be instigators and leaders and minor entertainers, but the burden and onus was not on us to, to come up with as much. We would come up with cheers. Uh, I imported some cheers, and we would write the better versions of other teams' fight stories, <laughs> which uh, for political uh, expediency we don't do anymore, um, or at least not publicly. Uh, that was right. part of what we did, yeah. And the, the spirit sessions were actually, some of them, integrated into our pre-game concerts. The skull yes. sessions yes, that were in uh, McGaw Hall, now Welsh Ryan Arena, and now are in Wildcat Alley. Those were almost open spirit sessions with the music. Hmm. You asked what the, the roles of the spirit leaders, and remember in the 70s when we were there, we hardly ever won a game. Yeah. I mean, there was a two year period, we only won one game. So not only were the spirit leaders um, getting us involved and, and keeping us up, they did it for the team and for the cheerleaders and for, the, for everyone, because there wasn't a lot to cheer about. And they kept everybody, they kept the energy going and the positiveness <coughs> going to, you know, even when we hardly ever won a game. Well, and that's a great, actually an interesting transition. One of the other things that happened in the 70s, uh, still love my transition, uh, <laughs> where women were added to the band, and that was the other big change of this period. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, Connie, you were in the first year. Yeah. So what was it like? Well, you know, I, I'm thinking back, and it's just kind of like, hmm, what was it like? Um, well, um, of course, we were being watched, but I'm not sure so much we were 18 years old. I'm not so, so sure that they were watching us to see if we could do it or if they were just watching us because we were 18 years old and we were shorts and some years. But um, I, I do remember I, when I went into the first rehearsal, I, like I said, I was the one who had known that was a lot of guys. Uh, the others kind of just joined because they like marching band in their high schools and they had no idea that this was like a 
it's been an important event, if you will. I, by accident, was a, one of the fortunate ones to be able to participate. But um, so we kind of stuck together pretty much, and uh, we did feel as though we needed to show them that we not only could march as well as they could, but we could march better than some of them. So um, that was part Are you of it. Sure. <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but, um, we, when we learned alma mater, we were not to sing anything above the tenor. And so we all sang the tenor part, which goes down pretty low. I was able to sing, but I'm sure there were people who couldn't get that low. Uh, and I still, to this day, will not sing anything up in the upper range. It's, it's got to be the tenor part of the four part that we learned. And um, we were proud of to be doing that. And nowadays, you can kind of hear some of the higher voices singing. Oh, <laughs> I'm not making them sing the tenor anymore. If, but, I, if, okay. I, if I can speak to this, because uh, I was actually in the band during the transition, mm -hmm. uh, although it's all been blurry to me. Uh, <laughs> what was the reason the women joined the band? I was under the impression that the ranks of the membership were thinning a little bit and they needed yeah. to mm -hmm. beef it up. That's so I opened it for that reason. And I also believe it was a requirement for a first year music major to be in the band, whether that was new, old, or that's not correct, I don't know. This was another way to beef up the numbers. Right, and I can speak to what my impression of that was, I'm not sure. It was my understanding that, well, I, as a music major, you were a music major for two years, and then your junior and senior year, you chose whether you were going to be a performance major, or musicology, or music education. So in those first two years, no one was like focused on, I'm going to be a performer. Um, it was... I was never heard that it, you were required, although I, I believe maybe there was that requirement at one time, but it was understood that if you were a male music major, you were going to be in marching band at least those first two years. It was the case when we were there for sure. So did they say it was that required? It was a requirement. Okay, so I think as the women were allowed to come in or whatever, we never felt that we were required to do that, and perhaps that's how it's kind of softened, because it was, I couldn't remember if it was a lot of music majors or not, but the numbers had dwindled, because Deb's got a, um, a block here of 150. My freshman year, we had 96. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I remember going uh, <coughs> recruiting up, uh, there were small groups of players that marched up and down the, uh, the first week or two of school, marched up and down the hallways in the dorms, trying to drum up people who played who could possibly join to help fill the block. So but in the official official reason that all of the Big Ten bands had to accept women Title was Title IX. If women could play sports, women sure as heck can march in a marching band. Yeah. I, 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 honesty compels. I have the county is being excessively um, she's not shining her light enough. <laughs> We had, I think it was 10 girls came in. By was, the end I, of the first year. I was a senior, and I had also, I was present, and I saw the change coming, and I lived in a family where I knew that there were certain things that, that were okay and weren't okay, and I knew that there were times my dad was biting his tongue. I can still name probably eight of the 10 girls who came in. The girls who came in were unbelievable marchers mm -hmm. across the board. There, there were no charity cases at all. And when she says try to be as good as something, like that, they, it, it, as far as their marching ability, I'm sure there were people who thought that they, they didn't belong. There was no question that they were among the very best right from the start. This one especially. Oh, yes. oh that's so true. Yes. Yes. My sister, not so much. Well, she <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you. <laughs> It wasn't that he didn't want girls in the band. He felt that they weren't physically able to do it. Then Connie died. Connie per se, per se, with her, the way she did it. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. Ask the men in the band when I was there weren't physically able to do it. <laughs> 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 well, and that, you know, right. part of it is that um, I was an athlete in high school, but because it was before Title IX, I never was able to do any interscholastic type competition. I, and I belonged on. I don't know, three or four sports during the year, but we had never done any competition with other schools. So when that went through, I was like, oh, I missed out. Well, so I was physically fit already. And perhaps that's 
part of why it really appealed to me because it was something physical you could do. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, and then eventually it petered into the university and they did have a gymnastics teams for three years that I was able to belong to and eventually got a, a letter for. But, but so, I mean, it helped that I was already physically, physically fit. I'll take the Peter line to jump in. Um, <laughs> I was a freshman when Connie and her classmates were seniors, so I remember being surprised to learn that these were the first women to be in the Northwestern Marching Band. My high school, it was probably an even number of men and women, or boys and girls, so there was nothing unusual to me, but I remember being impressed by how good all the women were, not to mention how hot. Um, and I'm sure, white shorts. Yeah. <laughs> those were the days. Yes, those were the days. So we, um, we got to the band banquet every year, and one thing that Mr. Painter did was say something about every senior uh, before um, they get they, I don't think we had as many senior speeches as any like we do now, but he said something about every single individual, and it always amazed me because. There are always people in the band who are quiet and none of us really knew really well and he had something to say about everyone and that was enlightening to those of us who didn't know that person. Um, so that year that you were a senior, uh, he went down the line and, and talked about every senior. <laughs> when he got to his daughter, he said, uh, and they were very short comments about each person, he said there was a time that I said there would be women in this band under my... Uh, over my dead body. And then he turned to Megan and said, Megan, it's been a pleasure. Oh. <laughs> and to me, that, that was an important moment because we all acknowledged there, there was no difference and it never should have been that way. It was part of the tradition um, that really Northwestern was not alone, but the time had changed and the time had come. Well, you know where that all started, of course. The marching bands were modeled after the military precision drill teams. Mm -hmm. And so that tradition had been established that way. A lot of, uh, of early uh, community bands were based on uh, VFW bands or uh, other military veterans organizations. They played in the service and, and they would continue it later. So it was, I don't think it was intended to be discriminatory. It just started out that way and it took a long time for it to change. I might add something as well. It, 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 that probably wasn't the case. And I remember John Painter's attitude toward it, at least which I, what I thought it was his attitude, which was corroborated already by the Painter family here. Uh, but the marching band, when I was there, was pretty much a, a macho group, I mean, led by a strong guy. It was, we thought, the second most important uh, function of the football season was the marching band. And we were right behind the, uh, the, the football team at that time. And when I went to school, it was much different than when you went to school. Because I can remember, I just read uh, Paul Flatley's little blurb in the 63rd or 50th reunion, he mentioned the fact that he remembered that we were second, we were first in the nation for two weeks in a row in 1962, and we were a heck of a football team, um, coached by a heck of a guy, Eric Parsidian, mm -hmm. and we were a group that supported them, and it was a, a macho group, and that's all there was to it. It was different. The Alumni Association was so excited about what Era Parsegian had done in that 1962 season that they bought him a purple and white Buick Wildcat automobile. And just a couple weeks later, I think, he announced that he was leaving Northwestern to become head coach at Notre Dame. Oh, that's right. Oops. Yeah. I don't know if he got the car back or not. <laughs> Um, well, the next topic is something you all have touched on already. It is the wonderful and sometimes not so wonderful topic of uniforms. Um, and, okay, I have to start with uh, Charles Neverill. Got it right. You told me about an interesting game where um, somehow you ended up with purple skin. 1958, uh, Oklahoma. Uh, under the uh, coaching auspices of uh, Bud Wilkinson, K 
came in and played at least a locally televised game here. Um, Oklahoma, of course, a great tradition of football, and, and Eric Parsini was the coach, and uh, I didn't go to, to this, I don't remember this pep rally, but somebody told me about it the other day, that Eric guaranteed that we would win the football game. At any rate, the, we, um, in my five years at Northwestern, in the Northwestern band, I don't think we ever had uh, rain slickers. I never remember rain slickers. And it rained that day in that Oklahoma game, something terrible. The turf was grass turf in those days. It had rained too hard to do a halftime show. But I'll tell you what, we sat in the, in the ranks for the whole game. John wouldn't move us. We were there in the ranks for the whole game, raining, raining, raining. There's a guy in the back row over there who was in that band with, with me, and I don't remember what he remembers, but I remember getting back to the dorm, taking off my uniform <laughs> and my body, except for the part above my uh, uh, shoulders, was completely blue. I mean, every, we were so wet. I mean, to, they must have had a heck of a bill uh, cleaning the uniforms uh, after, after that fiasco. Uh, <laughs> and then, Gary, you would mentioned you were actually the time when the uniforms changed. You were in band when they changed. I think it was a trait when the uniforms changed. Um, I don't know. I, I, did, them, did everybody get more than one uniform during the four years? No. 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 <laughs> we, we initially had something like the Ohio State has always had, I don't know what you call it, through the epaulets on the shoulder, there was the uh, uh, Mexican bandito uh, straps. There were no, there were no bullets there, but they were white straps. And you had to hook yourself in like a patrol boy's belt and uh, talk about uh, getting all dusty up. And you have to do that. So we had these uh, cro white crosses in front of us, and then we must have changed a year or two later to uh, having something with the sash. Yeah, with the sash. Okay, yeah. So the sash. It was fun to have them. We wore stats, maybe we still Hold it up for a second. A cape on the back. And a cape, right, right. The first okay. one said they have a cape the first year. Okay. Uh, Great. Uniformity was sort of a, a <coughs> strong point with my dad. There was a guy by the name of Dave Tuttle, and a reference was made to people who were music majors who maybe were brought in a little bit against their will. <coughs> and Dave, Dave uh, fancied himself to be an orchestral player from the start. Um, which he became, of course. Yeah. But he, he was—he was always a, you know. I mean, it was 1970. There were a lot of uh, people who were nonconformists in the band at that time. <laughs> Somebody. Anyway, we showed up, and, and Dave claimed this was a mistake on his part that he showed up for game day and he had on brown shoes. <laughs> and uh, the property manager at the time, Tim Schoolmaster, spotted it first, and Dave explained, "No, it'll be okay because I'm going to put spats over it. No one will really see it." And Tim corrected his thinking on that and pulled out a can of spray paint, black spray paint. And uh, Dave appealed to my dad for help, you know, to be for relief. Don't, don't let him do this. Don't let him paint my shoes. And my dad said, if he moves, shoot him. <laughs> From the tower. And, uh, so Dave had spray painted shoes. And I think it was the next year that an exception was made. Dave, not, music majors still had to march, but Dave Tuttle did not, as I recall. <laughs> well, and the other thing is that, Debbie, you had mentioned when women came into the band, it was still the male uniform. That's right. All right. So I was a lot skinnier in those days and still short, so my mother and I managed to hem up a pair of pants about that far. And I kept them all four years because we just didn't want to every year have to hem new ones. The jacket, I looked like I was wearing like my father's jacket. But it served me well because we had a very cold, I believe it was the Saturday of Thanksgiving. We had a very That's cold, very cold game, and I had the, held the record at that time of having five sweaters on under my jacket. Mm. <laughs> wow. I was not shaped in a way that it made a difference. <laughs> Fortunately, I kind of fit in it. I didn't even realize there could be an issue with the uniforms, personally. But, um, but with uh, long hair, I mean, oh, yeah, it was no, very no, clear was that up. nobody's oh, hair no. would show. Well, and some of the guys had long hair then, too. But uh, all the pictures that they showed with 
I mean, I think that's why I ended up in so many pictures, just because I could see that this hair was up in the back, and oh, there's one. <coughs> she took a picture of it. So, anyway. I have one more uniform uh, story to tell. And although we didn't have rain slickers, we did have these pr Prussian overcoats. And when the game weekend was going to be cold, we would be issued the Prussian overcoats. I think they must have weighed about 10 pounds a piece. And when we were issued these, the guy would just give you the overcoat and you know, go. Here's the overcoat and go. So uh, not until game day that I realized that my overcoat reached all the way to the ground. And we were playing at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, John Painter had a lot of friends there. And it was fine in the, in the uh, pregame, and it was fine in the halftime because we were in our regular uniforms. But in the postgame, it was cold, and we were going to leave shortly after that. So. John said, everybody put on your overcoats. So here I am, an E-10 clarinet roll right on the end, and I'm marching, and all you can see was no feet or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and John's friends are next to him, and, and, and they're giving him a hard time about, look at that guy. That's so funny, that little guy over there. He's got this long jacket on. <laughs> How come? And uh, Mr. Painter looked at them, this is the way I heard the story, uh, at least. He said, he's a divinical student, and that's required. <laughs> so, somewhat related to Charlie's earlier story about being cold and wet, uh, this would have been, I think, Connie, your senior year, and Debbie, your sophomore, that uh, we went to Michigan. And you know, before the internet, we didn't have really good weather forecasts, and we were told it's going to be sunny and clear, um, and leave the, the warmers or raincoats or whatever we had at home. And when we get there, it was a steady downpour through the entire game, and all we had was our uniform. And that's the first time I really recognized that when uniforms are wet, you smell like wet dogs. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. The whole yes. game. We, and there was no way to hide oh, yeah. right now. We were drenched. Well, and the last question I want to ask before I open it up to the floor um, is what did you, what kind of impact did your time in the band have on your overall life? You know, what are the things that, how did it, I think the principal question is how did it impact you? Well, let me just speak a little bit of that. Obviously, 38 years being married to my husband who I met in marching band was one, one of the impacts that there was. But um, when I came into Northwestern, although I was going to be a music education major, I, I kind of had aspirations to become a professional player. And um, as I went through, I was able to be in the orchestra at Northwestern, but many people that I was music majors with said, okay, we're going to go trap for civic. And there was a direct conflict between civics rehearsals and being in the marching band. And I chose to be in the marching band. So that really changed who knows where I would have been, or maybe I would have ended up in the same place. But for sure, it was just that there was that much of a desire to continue, even after two weeks of marching band camp and blowing my, <coughs> oh, blowing my auditions for orchestra, blah, blah, blah. Even for all that, it just was really, it gave me a sense of where I needed to be. Anyone else? I didn't ask this ahead of time. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I loved John. I've got lifelong friends from there. It just, it was, you know, you spent so much time every fall that that was the main thing that you did. Yeah, you did a few homework and a few school, but that was, that was the main event of, of fall. And uh, it, I loved every minute of it. Still true. <laughs> I don't know that I can separate the three issues of the marching band and band staff and John Painter. They, they all were interrelated, but I think the strongest lesson I learned from that time was the things that I thought were the limits of my endurance weren't. Hmm. We all had reserves that we didn't realize we had, and that experience, particularly John Painter, brought that out. There's no question what Char Chuck was just saying is, I think our universal experience, if you were in the band under John Painter, that um, he taught you that 
what you thought your limit was not, and that there was so much more that you could reach for and achieve. Um, yeah. Like everyone who comes to Northwestern, you're a smart person, you're accomplished in, in many and different ways. Um, speaking personally, I, mean, I had leadership roles before I got, <coughs> excuse me, before I got here. <coughs> So I never would have dreamed that I could have been a spirit leader or, or a role like that with such an outstanding organization in the Big Ten marching band, or that um, the guy who had been the announcer for 16 years that I thought no, no one would ever outlast, that I could more than double his tenure in this role, and uh, it it's now part of who I am and what I am. I can't just say. I had my four years in the band and four years at Northwestern, and that was it. Um, it completely redefined my life and who I am. When you, uh, when you think about a person as I do, as often as I do, think of John Painter, it, it certainly must have had a, an impression upon my life. Sure, music's always been important to me. It was very, a very close call in high school as to decide whether I should become a music major or not. I was, I was offered some form of a scholarship here from what my band director, my band student, told me. And I wanted to be pre-med, and I really couldn't be pre-med and be a music major, so I chose that route. But uh, you know, as I said, being a commuter, the, uh, uh, the family feeling that I had every year uh, that fall was wonderful. And even after graduation, I mean, I never missed homecoming. I have all these buttons to prove to it. <laughs> and well before, these aren't all of them, and well before there were caps or baseball caps being sold, people bought these purple berets yes. at, uh, back when they would come back. It wasn't just the purview of the season home players. Everybody would wear purple hats if they could. And uh, it was a pride and joy. And I want to congratulate this organization, too, for growing the way it has because you know, there were no number ones when we started, then there were number ones, and then several years when number ones became an official organization of the Illinois Association, which is phenomenal. And I'm always told that we are um, one of the strongest and most loyal um, groups there are. And if you turn around out the window, you'll see all the people walking back from ESPN College Game Day up there. <laughs> <laughs> Before kind of the rise of spirit team and, and uh, Jim and Terry, it was very regimented, and then these guys kind of came out as extroverts. How did band leadership, how did John Painter react to that? Like, was he just thought it was kind of funny? Or I mean, it seems strange that that was allowed to go on. Well, I think he recognized how important it actually was. Uh, the guy who was the grinder when I was spirit leader had his role for two years. I had it for one. And his, his name is Jeff Baker, and, and Jeff is very proud of the fact that one day Mr. Painter went to him and said, Jeff, the band is really down. We need more energy. And he relied on them to get the band fired up. You know, this, is, this is crunch time. Um, so there are some things that you just have to let happen um, and, and recognize that you, you've got to have a little bit of fun in order to accomplish things. Uh, Mr. Painter told the story, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, of being allowed to go to the Rose Bowl once with Ohio State and flew on the team plane, as I recall, and uh, Woody Hayes, the, the storied coach, uh, gets on the PA in the plane before they land and said, uh, now guys, we're going to go out there and have a good time. But just remember, it's not fun if you don't win. <laughs> so I think that that was part of a, a leadership message, too, that a band can be fun and is fun, but it's not fun if it's not good. So you know, don't, don't phone it in. You've got to work hard and, and have your fun with it. But in the end, if you fall on your face on the field as a band, then what's the point? So I think he saw that the, the spirit teams were actually part of what kept people engaged and kept them in it for the good and the bad. So when it got down to crunch time, we did deliver. That's, that's interesting because uh, we hadn't talked about the fact that there was a competitive nature band against band. And I remember that distinctly when we went on the field 
we were there to beat the hell out of the band that was the band of the day. Christina, there's you know, one minority, we talked about how the women came in, but I was in school when um, there really weren't many blacks in the band. Um, there would be occasional, you know, and it was like a, a rare event and a lot of people didn't know. Well, it was sort of a source of interest. When I was in the band, there were about, for the first time, there were five or six. And I think maybe the first kid who was uh, black was on the staff. And, and as sometimes happens, um, they tended to associate with themselves. They were part of the band and everything else. And Connie mentioned how you had to have your ha hair up under your hat. Well, that was a time when everybody had big afros, too. So that was a potential issue. And everybody was just a little bit touchy about it. And you said, how, did, how would my dad react to like spirit leaders? I think one of the, the greatest moments ever, uh, these guys, um, you know, spirit leaders were doing their one thing, and then there was this squad of like four black guys who were yes. marching around the side, and you're coming around the, the north end of the stands, yeah. that's the picture. Yep. And, it, and it was completely spontaneous, you know, He's he just ran it. down there, that was and what you, well, you can't He's tell from there, it's, it's like the soul, soul Train dance, yeah, doing, which he had never done in his life. <laughs> and if you notice, most of the pictures that capture it, those, the guys are dancing like this, and my dad's like, like this. He's like, their feet, you know, where's it going? But there was a point to it. It, it, wasn't, it would be out of character for him to draw attention to himself. The point was made, and it was an important one. The other thing I think that is important, and a lot of people forget, that when Chuck or Charlie were in the band, he was, my dad was only maybe seven or eight years older than him. So he was a, he was a kid, basically. He was ahead of his time in many ways. But he also had to, at that point, he had to be a disciplinarian because he had to kind of maintain a little bit of a distance. Um, it was rare that anybody had the opportunity, even though they were, I mean, if you talk to guys who were three or four or five years older than my dad, um, they didn't call him John. You know, you, you, didn't, you didn't do that. But eventually, he loosened up as he got older. And you know he was never short of confidence. I won't say you know, he, had get, he had to get confident, but he he understood that part of it a lot more. And I think the regimentation loosened up a little bit. It had to. I mean, when, when Gary and I were here, we were here from '69 to '73. What a crazy time to be in at this place. And you had to loosen up a little bit to survive. And I think to his credit, he he did it and adapted well. He also set some mm. expectations. We were never lectured, but we knew very clearly what the boundaries were of what we could do and not do. So, um, not exactly censorship, but it was, it, I mean, you could tell by the look he was giving you whether or not you would cross the line and don't ever do that again. Um, there were not, today, there are very long spirit sessions that are very entertaining and follow Thursday night uh, rehearsals. Um, spirit sessions, at least in my generation, were not separate like that. Um, Thursday nights were music rehearsals, indoors, sit down, and uh, the spirit team was given, a, depending on how crunched we were, anywhere from three to ten minutes, and that was the spirit session. So things, again, naturally evolve. And I was going to say, um, last night, uh, my husband's fraternity brothers, we met for dinner out in uh, Oak Brook. And one of the members was Don Schmidt, who was in the group with us. And he remembered some things, because he, he was up for the spirit leader, but he lost out to somebody. Oh. Anyway, and then I was like, oh, that's right. So he was mentioning when we were, and it was really special, when we were invited to Ohio, to participate in an Ohio State spirit se session before the game we played there. And how, um, I don't know if you were the, were you the spirit leader at that time? No. no. So whoever it was, the, Rick, Rick, it, was, it was Rick, yeah, right? right? And so he uh, knew all of the uh, the songbook that they go through, all their spirit and all stuff. We had words for every one of their songs. So as soon as they would do theirs, we would sing our rendition of it. And it was just, it was great. I mean, it was supposed to be such an honor to even be invited to this, because it's usually closed to everyone, but our band was invited because... I guess we were that special. <laughs> well, Mark, Mark Peterson has a copy of that and has very generously made that available. And um, a lot of alums have now well, that's heard right, that. That's right, because I think that's what Don was saying, is he had seen right. it. Right. And, and, and I've heard it, yeah. At, at the time, um, I, you know, we had cassette tapes, and someone gave me a cassette recording of that same thing. So when we went, 
uh, when I was spirit leader, five years after that, mm -hmm. I studied and transcribed everything on that recording, so we were prepared and basically reenacted it. And because it was five years later, there was no one in the band at Ohio State who had been there when that happened. So it was all over again. Bam, bam, we just smacked them down one after the other, yeah, including course. me conducting them in one of their songs. And, How do you know this? We got this covered, then we came back with our version, and, you know, wiped them down. <laughs> by, by the way, I think we were beating Ohio State 12 to 7 at halftime of that game in Columbus. Hmm. It was amazing. Not when I was there. Not when I was there. 60 to nothing. We lost this game, but yeah. it was a phenomenon that we had a lead at halftime. But they won the halftime. <laughs> 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 and we had a stadium that looks like, uh, you know, it's, it's like a, a monument. And they had these um, uh, state troopers with shotguns. Oh, well, I was saying, I was worried that if we won the game, they would take aim at it. <laughs> um, there was another question in the back. I was going to ask, at the end of practice, we always used to say, who's got the best band in the land? Do they still do that? Uh, I don't know. Did they do it during your era? Do they do it now? Yeah. After games, uh, at, at the band circles up at the end of the game on the field and sings the alma mater, and uh, uh, Dr. Thompson leads that, leads that chant. Do they say anything afterwards? Um, they don't say anything. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I have a question for Pete. Um, I didn't think I was going to raise this issue, but you said that being in the band was a seminal moment. I always thought I was a seminal moment. <laughs> And so, you know, maybe we have more in common than I've realized over the years. <laughs> <laughs> I need to look into this a little bit. <laughs> say, are there any other questions? That's another interesting one. The, the circle in the middle of the field, and, and maybe Peter, someone who's been around, when did that start? Because I know we never did it back in the... I mean, we never went on the field. We'd march out and we'd meet up back by the, uh, the equipment room. Mm -hmm. To turn stuff in, and then they dismiss from there. But we never had. I remember coming around and we marched out and played by the lot, the old locker room. Right. That, that was that was a purpose that we would play outside. The, the picture that Debbie yeah. has, yeah. generally outside the right. stadium, outside, outside, outside right. the team right. locker room. Right. Right. So we would we would play for them, and we would do the we love our team cheer for them, and then we would do the alma mater, and um, and Mr. Painter would ask who's got the greatest band in the land. Um, that was very much in public. Yeah. Uh, our family and friends and other people would hang around and, and watch and hear what was going on and they could hear whatever parting comments Mr. Painter had for us before we were dismissed. Um, when the stadium was remodeled after the 96 season, that's when things started to change because the locker room then was relocated to the north end of the stadium. We tried to do the same thing outside the locker room doors so the team could hear us, but that's a very narrow area and family or the team and friends are all waiting out there. So we had completely blocked traffic. Well, you can't do that. So we moved to the northeast corner by that gate and then we found out the team doesn't even hear us over there. Mm. So then it evolved, so we moved under the northeast corner of the stadium outside of what was then the band equipment room, and we'd be within the gate and people would be outside watching. I, it just reminded me of that scene from Sound of Music with the nuns locking the gate. <laughs> and all the family and friends are you know, craning their necks to look in the fence as we're um, huddled up, arms around each other, singing the alma mater, and uh, Dr. Thompson doing the, the dismissal. Uh, and then we lost our storage room under the stadium and we had no place to go so there was a, a game where it was it was kind of a mob scene and it just made sense let's just huddle up on the field after the post game concert and then form one big circle so like everything things just evolved yeah. and that was kind of a slow evolution of what happened there can i ask a question we didn't touch on this um about how things have changed, how the homecoming parade has changed. When I was a little boy, my aunt was a, a PhD candidate here, and she would bring me and her family to watch the homecoming parade. And I was a little kid, and I thought it would be great, and of course I achieved that goal. But that parade was not here on Sheridan Road. That parade was in downtown Evanston through Fountain Square. Mm -hmm. uh, do you people remember marching in downtown Evanston? No, we went up Sheridan Road. Chuck or, or, or uh, 
Ms. Navarro, where did you march in the homecoming parade? Was it on the campus or was it in downtown Memphis? Oh, it's on across Central Street. I remember a lot of things, but I can't answer that question. I mean, it, it's been down Sheridan Road now. I thought, it, I, I, thought we, I thought we marched down Sheridan Road but in those days, but... Well, I think it was Sheridan and Bull. Yeah. Bull Run. And, and I remember Bull having pep Bull rallies Bull. down on the North Campus, too, on the other... On the, on the west side of, uh, of Sheridan Road. Well, there are always questions of how do we deal with the city because we've got traffic and people, and when depending on when the parade is, um, we're going to be either attracting a big crowd or no crowd, and they'd experiment. They'd go up and down Central a few times. They'd go through downtown Evanston, and um, also some of the homecoming parades were Saturday morning before a game. I remember marching across Central basically to the stadium before a game. That was that was tough to do all that okay. one day. Are there any other questions? Hey, uh, well, first of all, thank you all so much. Um, and to the Painter family as well, you guys have added a bunch of great comments. Um, my question was about, when I was doing some research, by the way, Andrew Levin, you may have seen some of my articles in the newsletters. I like to do a lot of historical research. Um, one thing I encountered was while um, Bainham was off uh, doing military service during World War II, uh, it talked about the band being co-ed. Do any of you know about that at all? During the World War II? Yeah. No. No? No, no, no. I don't know about co-ed. I, I know that they were very much hurt for uh, personnel, and so you have, you know, now those a lot of those people have moved on, but uh, there were a lot of, uh, you'd run into people who never went to Northwestern who were high school students at Evanston who would oh. march in the marching band or, or would come in from University of Chicago and march in the marching band. So they were, uh, and actually, I don't know, you know, Mom? Who was who was con who was doing the marching band when Mr. Bain was in Europe? I have no idea. I don't know. It's in the thing that Frank Frank wrote. Oh, all right. Well, it, there's some information. It exists on somewhere, it. but okay. so so the, at, at, there had to be archives. someone. There had to be someone who was a, a director of the marching band, other than the ones we usually think of. But honestly, I don't know because mm -hmm. whoever it was, I'm sure did it exactly the way Mr. Bainham wanted it. There, is, there would have been no room for uh, innovation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's actually, for anyone who wants a pretty good history of the band, it doesn't have all the color that these panels do. Uh, <laughs> Frank Vespo, I can never pronounce it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, wrote his thesis on the band, oh. and it's available um, on the archives website. Excuse me, it was an independent project. Just oh, yeah. Frank did it. There have been several dissertations that have been written on that. Can, can somebody speak about what Kevin Leonard is doing for the marching band? Oh, yes, for next year? Next year. No, I just mean, it, yeah, in a general rule, what he's doing. Oh, yeah, for Kevin, the Kevin Leonard. But also about next year. Yeah, Kevin Leonard is uh, one of the university archivists. He went over with a couple of our older um, NAM alums and went to the band office and worked out taking all of the history out of the office. Because, quite frankly, they were running out of room. And uh, a number of band directors were very good pack rats. Uh, which is wonderful when you're trying to develop history. Uh, he is in the process of um, cataloging it all. I think he's almost finished the painter papers, or he has. Oh, no. Yeah, oh. He has. <laughs> <laughs> he's finished the ones he has. He's finished the ones he has, okay. Um, but and, but they, are, they have huge amounts of material um, that they're working on. If you ever want to do a paper, they're willing to let you dig. Um, they have boxes and boxes of photographs, so we have lots of material to, to populate hopefully doing some kind of online um, display. Uh, also, uh, Brittany's actually the one who told me this. Is that still true? Uh, yeah, well, one of the other things they have is that they have a, a one of every band uniform, of every mm -hmm. era. Um, and I think most of the drum major uniforms and two and, and, and batons and all that kind of thing. So next year, I don't think it's specifically for homecoming, but during next year's homecoming, maybe for most of the fall, every display case in archives in the Deering, um, Library is going to be dedicated to the marching band. So wow. they're, going have, they're going to have the uniforms up. They're going to have a lot of the, the papers and, and, and all that stuff displayed. So if come you back go, next year, too. Yeah, if you go over there right now, um, in the front lobby of Deering, if you go through the Deering doors, uh, they have the batons from 
the true the sister brother duo. Yeah. Good. The, yeah, the yeah. They have them out with pictures and because their big thing is on scrapbooking and they have some scrapbook materials from us with the twin. Yeah, I, I want to just this is more in the nature of a plug for Kevin. Uh, sometimes when people talk about university archives, you kind of get that picture of like at the end of Indiana Jones, when it's just like a train going somewhere. Right. And we had to overcome that a little bit ourselves because much of Mr. Batum's material found its way into my mom's basement. Much of my dad's oh. material. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of it's still there, too. Um, but uh, this, this guy, Kevin Leonard, is just the best. Um, uh, I, I haven't run into too many people around here in an administration who feels as strongly about football and WAMU and about marching band, and he's totally sincere. So not only, and, and he's, he's very gifted as far as being an archivist too, also. So if it means anything, our family has completely committed ourselves uh, with confidence to turn our stuff over. And I would just encourage everyone here, not, not only just to, as, as time goes on, you'll have a great resource, but supplement that resource yourself. I mean, um, you know, for us, it, it, it took a little doing to decide, well, we got all this great stuff, and, and not just my mom. I mean, I've, I've been putting stuff together for a long time. Eventually, you have to say, yeah, it's really great stuff. I'm going to give it to Northwestern Archives, and I'll know where it is. You know, I can go look at it when I want to. It doesn't have to be in my house. Yeah. And uh, I just think as, as time goes on, it's going to be, a, he, just, he just loves the history of the band. And part of it is, the work of the Numalons. You've maintained a presence and an image where it has become important to people like Kevin and important to other people in the administration. But um, do what you can to support the archives, the library, Kevin Leonard and his efforts. Drop him a note and say thanks. Encourage him because he's uh, one of the best friends the band program has had in years, in my opinion. Well, and that's our ultimate goal, uh, is to digitize what we can and make sure everything is safe with the archives. Um, everybody brought this stuff. They don't know this, but I'm going to borrow it and scan it. Um, we want to get everything electronic because the archives are great for research, but anything, especially pictures, especially stuff that's very easy to, to consume and isn't like 20 page long papers, because I hate to tell, it, tell you, but today's generation takes things in five second sound bites. Um, <laughs> we want to have it up on the internet, and that's our ultimate goal. We're not there yet, we're still collecting, um, but that's our goal. Um, is to take part of what the archives has and make sure that it's a presence so that people can learn that, you know, we're one of the oldest university marching bands in the country and we have this huge history. Um, and it's nice to brag about it occasionally. Kevin will take anything, everything, and you don't have to feel that what, it's insignificant. I found, we, we inherited Mr. Bain of bronze baby shoes. <laughs> he wants them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of course. He will take anything. And yeah. oh, we're not kidding. There's people who've given me, they're like, what about this? I'm like, here, I'll take it to the archives. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. yeah, and don't feel like you have to give them, this is directed to you, Mom. <laughs> don't feel you have to tell them the context of everything or, or the, what the details are on it. He's trained, give it to him, and he'll, he'll give it a context. Right, yeah. Mom? Yes, yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> And it was boxes and boxes. We have old film, um, which we'd somehow point and have to get transferred to digital. We have old film. I think we have actually a couple of year, a couple of shows from Batum's era. I have a couple at home. Yeah. Oh. And they have to go in there. What? <laughs> they have to go into Kevin. Right? Yeah. And so it's, there's a lot out there. And that's what we're happy about, is that people are interested. If you have material, um, feel free to donate. Um, we always love to see it, because then we'll scan it, and then we have it in our, our possession, and then we'll make we, everything we get. If you don't want it back, we give it to our guys. Yeah, we pass it on. to it because uh, I don't want it lost in my room or in my apartment. Let me mention two other things, too, in this context. Uh, I understand that the 1960 Strike Up the Band film mm -hmm. is, on is, YouTube. is on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Have you all seen it? Be no. yeah. it's wonderful. If you haven't, that's a fantastic source of information about what the band was like. And that was slightly before my time, but we had the same uniforms, and, and I knew all the people that were in that in that film. It's, it's wonderful to see that. The other thing is, if you if you haven't already gotten a copy of the 50-year retrospective CD, 
of the marching band. Held a couple. It's, it's great just to hear that old material, hear how actually how good some of those old bands were. Also, the booklet that goes along with that, which Bruce had a big hand in putting together, uh, is a wealth of information about the history of the marching band. And that's available for anybody who wants it. Chuck did a lot of recordings for that. He's the person really responsible for getting the sound of the bands to be as good as it is. So thank you, Chuck. Mm -hmm. And to end up, I wanted to thank all of our panelists for coming. Thank all of you for coming. And uh, I guess the last thing to say is, go Cats. Go Cats. Go cats. <laughs>